Hello and welcome to our session about management of quality. It's going to cover chapter 9 and chapter 10. Uh, so basically the entire quality section of the management, the uh, operations management book and this is part of the QDC1 course. So um, what does the term quality mean? Um, Quality is, is the ability of a product or service to consistently meet or exceed customer expectations. And, and what's nice about this definition is that quality always uh, has to connect to the customer expectations. If you are not in line with what the customer wants, it doesn't really matter if you think or if your process seems to tell you that everything is at the highest quality. Quality has a lot of quantitative elements to it which is you know the, the, the actual measuring and, and the mathematical aspects of it but it also has a very significant qualitative portion of it which is the perceptions of, of the quality perception of the customers of how high of a quality um, you uh, are producing and you'll see when we talk about co uh, quality controls is that there's a lot of math here there's a lot of uh, scientific methods to measure quality but the decision of what you define as quality is uh, is very very uh, um, um, variable in terms of what your customers perceive as quality and what you qualitatively again uh, 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 decide that you uh, consider to be high quality so, um, in the world of quality uh, management and uh, the scientific uh, and philosophical aspects uh, surrounding quality, uh, you have a lot of different people who contributed to it. Um, uh, uh, Stuart Deming, um, uh, Ishikawa, uh, Taguchi. Um, you can see that, you know, uh, the Jap Japanese uh, um, 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 scientists and, and uh, um, uh, managers have uh, contributed a lot into the world of quality because uh, quality um, is uh, one of the cornerstones of Japanese manufacturing. Um, and which is discussed uh, uh, in detail in if when you go through the lean operations is just in time but I think the the, the two most uh, uh, well-known contributors for quality management is Deming and Stewart uh, in, in terms of being kind of the fathers of uh, quality and actually um, uh, Japanese uh, quality uh, philosophy uh, is based a lot uh, on what uh, Deming uh, his 14 points of qualities and he actually went to Japan after World War II to help them um, um, improving their production quality. Um, Deming's 14 points, you don't have to remember these 14 points uh, for the exam but you have to understand the concept. I'm not going to go over all the 14 points but uh, really what what Deming uh, 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 came with the way he revolutionized the idea behind quality is that 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 he he was one of the first people to say that quality is not just one discrete part of a process. Quality needs to be embraced by everyone, from top management all the way down to the worker, and and you have to continuously improve your quality. You can't just say, okay, you know, I have a whole process. At the end, I have a department, a quality department. They check and you know they sample whatever we produce, and then uh, based on that, they decide if, uh, if if we meet quality or not. Which is, you know, it, it, it does help with quality, but but Deming's way of viewing quality is is, is a total philosophical. Uh, way of doing business. So quality really starts from design all the way down to manufacturing. It's part of the process. It's part of training, and and, and uh, um, really, it's it's a never-ending process. It's not something that you do once, but you always try to improve the quality. And really, from in terms of of of, of uh, in terms of, of understanding. Uh, what Deming brought to the world of quality, it's more than just methods. It's really a, 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 a change in the way you think about quality. Uh, Taguchi loss function. Um, when uh, when uh, you think about quality from a manufacturing point of view, uh, you, you always translate it to to cost benefit. So you know what what am I what am I losing by not having uh, 
a good quality. And obviously, uh, and we'll talk about this later in the session, but obviously if you have a la lousy quality, you're going to use lose business and there's going to be a, 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 a cost for poor quality. But it used to be the traditional way that, that people would view the cost function in terms of quality would be that it was, it, it was a, a linear deterministic uh, function, which means that it, it was it, it, it kind of said like as long as I meet my low if as long as I'm between my lower and upper specifications in terms of quality, I you know I don't care. I mean that that's I you know if I decided that uh, the the, the um, you know the minimum quality and the highest quality are, are a certain range between them, there's no real the, I, I'm not losing money. Um, there's no real uh, cost to that to that uh, differentiation in terms of quality levels as long as I'm between those two lines and what Taguchi said is that that's not true uh, if you if you're not meeting your quality um, um, an optimal quality there's always a cost to it and the cost is not is not straight line it's not an, it's a nonlinear cost but 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 the the idea here and the philosophical concept here is that there's always a cost for not having quality and 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 you cannot you know in in terms of, of of total quality in terms of focusing on quality you cannot just say okay I'm between these two lines and that's it you know that's what I care about you have to understand that the the the, the cost of not having a, a good quality is something that is going to impact you uh, um, even if you are between your lower and upper specs so this is kind of looking quality to the next level in terms of of uh, of focus on how important it is. Uh, determinants of quality design. So if you design a product from the get-go, the engineers who, who do the design, design it to have high quality, then everything else is going to to have higher quality, the, the, the manufacturing, the customer satisfaction. Um, um, if you start with a high quality design, and design would be what, what what materials to use, how parts come together, what safeguards you put into the into the product. Really, uh, uh, making sure that even even when you you are just on 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 the whiteboard working on a product, you have quality as part of the design. And and I can tell you personally that 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 designing for quality in mind is very different from just designing regularly because there is a cost in terms of design to add quality. It's not it's not a given. It's something that you have to actively pursue and, and decide that it is important for you uh, to a degree, of course, because you know there is always a trade-off. But uh, but but if you come with the mindset that from the get-go you're going to design for quality, it's a different type of design. The next one is is conformance to design. So I came with a design, great. You know, I'm an engineer. I, you know, I, I I I I came. I designed a very very great high quality product, but you also have to make sure that people actually conform to it and conforming to it uh, uh, needs to be achieved by the, the the manufacturing process so how do you how do you actually get the quality um, 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 vision to uh, to 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 become a real product but also how do you control and measure the process of manufacturing to make sure that you conform to the design because you know you need to have some kind of measurable scientific way to see if you are meeting the design uh, quality requirements. Ease of use in terms in terms of quality, uh, um, 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 you want to make sure that 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 the design and the product that you're doing and the and the process that you're doing. Is 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 easy to use because if you don't, if it's not easy to use, if it's not easy to to conform to the to the to the to the design and, and conform to the to the quality of design, it's going to make it very very hard to to have a a a, a, um, a quality uh, product. Um, um, having a super complicated, uh, you know. Uh, uh, with a million different uh, um, parts uh, machine, um, I'm not saying necessarily you can't have a high quality product, but it makes it a lot, a lot harder. Um, and after sale service means that, you know, when when I sell you 
the product you okay you got you got the product and you know you're all happy with it but the question that you know all of us come to it comes to mind is if it breaks if I need service to it what kind of what quality of service am I going to get and think about you know fixing your car uh, less less uh, today with electronics but um, really any type of after sale service that you need to get you know the maintenance of the machine is also part of the of a determinant of quality so uh, when I buy a complete product and I and you know I look at these four puzzles uh, pieces I need to think okay uh, you know the judging a, a, a product as being a high quality means that it has great design great features in it you know it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, it does everything I want it to do in a high quality Conformance to the con conformance to the to design means that it was actually manufactured based on the on the design, and it's really high quality manufacturing, right? You can have nice features, but they're not, you know, they're not, they're not conformance to design. It's easy to use, you know. I can I can. It's not so complicated that that I can't use it, and I can't even understand all these cool features. And then the support that I get for this product. Um, uh, in terms of services, in terms of if I if I have questions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is high quality. So if I if all these things work together, it's gonna it's gonna uh, 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 come down to having a high quality product. Now, what are the costs of quality? Nothing is free, right? Th this is a business uh, uh, a course, and 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 one of the. Uh, um, I think one of the 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 main concepts of business is there's nothing's free, right? You always have trade-offs. There's if you want to have high quality, then there has to be some cost to it. And there are there are three types of costs. Failure cost is the worst cost. That means that this is the cost that happens when uh, when you have defective parts, uh, when you have returns, and you have unhappy customers. You really don't want to have failure costs. Obviously, it happens. Uh, you know, it's, it's the nature of the beast, but that's the t that's the worst type of of, of 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 cost of quality, the failure cost. Then you have the appraisal cost. The appraisal cost is the 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 cost that 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 you need to appraise the quality before it gets to the customer, right? So it's your QA department, um, it's your sampling, your inspection. That's how you. I mean. Uh, if you don't have some type of appraisal cost, mean it means that you're basically not checking it. Now you can you want to minimize it, right? You don't want to have to check everything. But if you're not checking anything and you have zero appraisal cost, then there's a higher chance that you're going to have failure cost. And the third type of of cost, which usually uh, is the best type of of cost, best in terms that it's better to have prevention costs, which is to make sure that you don't have failures to begin with, as part of the design, training, and your employees employees and 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 what kind of uh, what kind of a process you have but that's that's the that's the best type of cost because if you can prevent something from breaking to begin with then in the long run it's much much cheaper uh, quality awards I'm not going to read this entire slide for you but uh, there are two types of two big types of uh, 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 quality awards not types two awards um, that uh, the book talks about the Deming Prize which is a Japanese um, award and it's in honor of Deming like I said he went to Japan and he helped them develop these quality systems and the US version is the Malcolm uh, Baldridge National Quality Award so you know just uh, if you're you know, read the book you can learn more about these awards but uh, you know um, they basically certify and, and 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 they they promote high quality. Um, quality certification, the ISO, this the International Organization for Standardization. It's a very European thing, uh, though a lot of uh, American companies do get ISO certified, um, and they are. Uh, many many different uh, ISO certification and standards you know th there's a joke that the great things about one of the great things about standards is that there are so many to choose from which <laughs> you know obviously uh, uh, makes fun of the fact that there are way too many standards but but standards are good and especially when it comes to the world of quality because you know it, it's very hard to to agree about what quality is or what's the best way to get quality if you don't put people in a room and kind of decide on a standard um, the three 
standards, the ISO standards that uh, you know you learn about in the book, um, are is the ISO 9000, uh, which is very very popular in in Europe um, and again also in the U.S. Which is it doesn't define the actual quality of your product, but it helps you achieve consistent results. It kind of tells you the best practices, the best the best uh, processes, and what it does in order to for you to get certified with ISO 9000, they actually have to audit your documentation, your quality processes. Um, they'll come to your uh, 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 factory or if it's a you know if it's a business service oriented business they'll come there and they'll audit you and you have to get recertified so it's a, it's a very serious process and um, um, it doesn't guarantee you know I've worked with uh, ISO 9000 companies that weren't the highest quality but it does give you a sense if you have to choose between a company that doesn't have ISO and a company that does have ISO 9000 is that you know that the 9000 at least knows they have knowledge of what they should do they might not be following it but they they definitely know because it's such a, such a tedious and 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 um um uh, hard to get certification that uh, uh at the end of the process even if you don't follow at least you know what you should do uh the iso uh, 14 uh 1000 uh, is the framework for environmental so you know being sustainable is becoming a very important part of business today so this gives you a framework for the strategic approach that you should do if you if being environmentally uh, is important to you or uh, more than important it's a necessity the ISO 24700 is, is is focused more about OEM original um, um, equipment manufacturer and that means when you build something that it that is that's using parts uh, um, from other manufacturers I don't mean raw material like you're building you know you're building a computer and the computer has different OEM types so you know the network cards from comes from uh, one company the the, the, the graphic cards from comes from Nvidia you're not manufacturing any of it you're just getting a finished product that goes into your finished product so the ISO 24700 specifies uh, um, uh, the quality conformances and, and standards uh, in terms of working with OEMs um, total quality management uh, TQM is you know it's very very popular in the world um, of so it, it, it's uh, something that um, uh, um, started really uh, being you know uh, um, very popular in Japan in the 1960s and um, less in the US um, but uh, starting in the 1980s uh, when American companies starting asking themselves how come these Japanese are taking over America with all these beautiful high quality products and for a cheaper price and then uh, you know after you know going to Japan talking w with, with people there seeing manufacturing they realized that uh, uh, one of the main reasons for the Japanese tremendous success uh, with such limited resources was total quality management and total quality management the word total is what's important here is because it's a philosophy that involves everyone in an organization in a continual effort to Im improve quality and customer satisfaction so it's total involvement it's continuous continuous improvement you know it's not just in one big change and that's it we don't have to worry about quality it's always thinking about quality and it's always focusing on customer satisfaction um, and when you wh when you think about about TQM and you say oh you know it's uh, everybody's involvement what do you mean everybody's involvement what really TQM is 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 more about a philosophy than it is about uh, uh, processes and how to manufacture. Yes, it does have method methods and, and methodology of how to produce and manufacture stuff, but really it's a philosophical thing, and that's why a lot of companies fail to implement TQM is because they really don't have commitment from the top all the way down. So uh, uh, TQM involves organization practices, leadership, the mission statement, uh, how do you how do you operate uh, uh, the operating procedures. The, the, the support, the training, um, um, you have to have quality It's part of everything in the organization. Um, and it, it goes down to the principles, so you have to say, okay, I am focused on my customers, I am always improving, 
benchmarking which means that I'm going to compare myself all the time to make sure that I am meeting my expectations but also that I can become better just in time uh, uh, all the different tools for TQM which we'll see in a few slides um, uh, then it goes down to the employee fulfillment, the empowerment. Be in, 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 in order for uh, TQM to work, people need to be uh, uh, committed to it, um, not just the CEOs who are making millions, but also the employee who's making minimum wage. You need to empower your employees because at day's end, if the, the person at the assembly line sitting there um, doesn't care or is not or it does not tell you that there's an issue and just lets things fly by because they're like ah you know I'm making minimum wage I'm not you know there's no real organizational commitment then it's not going to work employees attitude needs to be focused about about quality and then all this drills down to customer satisfactions so you're going to have people that you know that that are going to to come back you're going to have uh, uh, um, um, successful uh, sales and a great example for uh, TQM um, is, is how Apple's quality uh, is such a such a total quality product so so the quality in Apple really r r w was running from Steve Jobs that was crazy crazy about quality and about everything being perfect to you know to the to the focus the customer focus and the continuous improvement focus of the company of Apple is is is, is putting quality as part of its mission statement to the employees you know everybody was focused on quality down to us as customers that we buy Apple because it's such a high quality and we're willing to pay more for it and we and some of us will buy only Apple because it's such a high quality product. Continuous improvement, which we also talked about in the lean operations, is one of the pillars of, of total quality management. In order for total quality management to work, you have to you have to continuously try to improve your system and never never sit and say, okay, you know what, everything is perfect. I don't have to improve it. And the way I like to describe it is, is that you know the traditional way of thinking about quality is if it's not broken don't fix it the the continuous improvement the TQM uh, uh, way of thinking about it is it uh, is saying if it's not broken it doesn't mean you can't make it better so it really really it's a philosophical uh, uh, idea but also you know in terms of uh, in terms of the methodology of how you're going to produce stuff, you really want to always give uh, uh, opportunities for improvement, and 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 this translates into, for example, you you need your, your your employees to feel comfortable to tell you there's a problem. You need management to be uh, open-minded to listen to improvements and 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 accept when there is an issue. You need to measure stuff continuously so you can know when and how to improve stuff and you need to try to understand the core issues and not just patch stuff so continuous improvement is really one of the the, the cornerstones of, of total quality management Stewart's a uh, PDCA model uh, what it stands for is plan do check and act and this is continuously. It happens all the time. It keeps on going. You never stop. So what is it? Plan. You identify a, a pattern and you make a plan. So in the planning phase, you're like, okay, I want to improve my uh, uh, quality, and you know, this is the plan. This is what I think is going to work. This is how. This is what I think I should change in my processes to make the manufacturing better. Um, you do it. You actually test it. You see if it works. You check. You know, say, okay. You know, is it working? Am I getting better results? Is it not? Is it uh, is it worse now? And then you act as you implement the plan. And then you go again. You plan again. You say, okay, I've implemented this improvement. Now uh, here's an idea that we got from our uh, employees that might make it better. You do it. You test the plan. You check it. You act. So the, it's really a continuous improvement that that uh, uh, that follows basically common sense. But the idea here, the philosophy here, is that you always, always, continuously try to make your production and processes better. Six Sigma, uh, six, six Sigma is a business process that improves quality and reducing 
cost. It was uh, developed in Motorola. Uh, in Motorola, I worked with them a couple of years ago. They are you know crazy about Six Sigma, obviously. Uh, but it was it was uh, it, it became very popular with the GE. Jack Welsh was uh, you know the legendary CEO of GE. Uh, was a big advocate of Six Sigma and and um, today you know uh, if you look for for job that has to do with quality having a Six Sigma uh, certification is a really good thing it does it, it is difficult to get but it's a good thing to have uh, so s the reason they call it Six Sigma Sigma stands for standard deviations and basically what is it's uh, what it's saying is that uh, statistically you need to have no more than 3.4 defects per million think about it so that comes to 99.9997 percent uh, um, of uh, of products that you produce are are within your quality limits uh, so that's 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 pretty high I mean this is 3.4 defects per million is, is pretty amazing and um, companies meet them you know companies do follow Six Sigma uh, but it's more than just you know that the 3.4 defects per million because that's every you know every exam you take about six sigma you're gonna have a question about the 3.4 um, uh, defects per million but six sigma is a lot more than that it, it's a conceptual uh, thing it's about 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 using certain tools and techniques but also again following a very strict philosophy about about having quality total quality as part of how you do business. Um, so this is just a graph showing you what Six Sigma means. So you have this graph which is showing normal distribution. Later in this core in this session, I'll explain a little bit about the statistics. And this is where you know it, it, um, between the the two black lines is where you you need everything to fall uh, in terms of quality. And it's plus minus three standard deviations. That's the sigma, and that's why it's Six Sigma. Uh, uh, sorry, that's uh, plus minus three uh, sigma. Uh, with a six sigma, uh, it's plus minus six uh, standard deviations, uh, which shows you how extremely quality focused this uh, uh, philosophy is. So uh, you move from 2,700 defects per million to 3.4 defects per million. I mean, it, it's 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 a huge huge focus on on on, on quality. Uh, the Six Sigma program, uh, like I said, was originally developed by Motorola, um, and uh, um, it's really been since then a lot of U.S. companies and a lot of companies in the world ha ha have been following it. And uh, important thing about uh, about um, about Six Sigma and about any, by the way, about any quality program is that it, it, you, you know. It's not just about it's not just about being able to follow a specific uh, mathematical structure. Uh, it, it, it is about it's it's about focusing on the customer. It's about having a process that 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 really takes into consideration the high, the quality of what you're manufacturing. And you know one of the things about Six Sigma that they call it is the DMAIC. Uh, 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 philosophy, which is you define the outputs and and identify the gaps, and and this is where it's really important to understand that six sigma uh, is only as good as what you define as the critical outputs. So if you if you if you decide that you know yeah um, I don't really I mean my quality uh, limits uh, or or definitions of what quality is are so broad that yeah even though I am six sigma. Uh, my products they're not very good so it's not just about following a mathematical uh, way of doing stuff or calculating some standard deviations it's really about what you define as a company as the standards for uh, your quality then you have to measure and measure you know if you don't measure the work if you don't collect data then you can never improve and you can never know if you're actually meeting your requirements you have to analyze the data obviously and then you have to improve the process so six sigma is, is it follows the same concept of continuous improvement uh, and then the fifth uh, uh, the c is to control the new process uh, and, be, and to make sure that it maintains what levels of quality you want and then you can just like the PDCA you continue doing this this is a never-ending cycle of always defining critical outputs measuring analyzing improving and then 
controlling to make sure that you met what you wanted to do. Um, I think we kind of covered uh, um, most of the Six Sigma uh, points. Um, one interesting thing from this slide is that it's really important to um, to emphasize that Six Sigma is ab about people. So, uh, yes, you know the most famous thing about Six Sigma is the 3.4 uh, uh, defects per million, but it, it really is about the people, and that's where you have those black belts and green belts, etc. You have different certifications for experts of Six Sigma, but it's not going to work if people from the organization are not, are not trained very well trained and are dedicated to implement Six Sigma. Uh, Lean Six Sigma, as like the name implies, it's a combination of lean operations with Six Sigma because lean operations, also known as just-in-time operations, are kind of uh, similar in some ways to Six Sigma and, and they, they both emphasize uh, uh, customer satisfaction and, uh, and, and, and total quality and continuous improvement and everybody, you know, being committed to it. Uh, um, but uh, lean operations also uh, focus, and uh, there's, you know, I, I, I uploaded a video that talks just about that. That's chapter 15. But lean operations they focus uh, beyond just quality. They also focus on 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 how do you maintain a lean operation in terms of inventory and being cost effective. Uh, the t the quality tools of TQM. So uh, you have the seven basic quality tools. Uh, flowcharts, check sheets, histograms, pa Pareto analysis, scatter diagrams, control charts, cause and effect diagram, and run charts. We'll talk about each one of those. Um, so, tools for generating ideas. You use check sheets, scatter diagrams, and cause and effects. And the idea is that uh, um, they allow you to get a, a, a system view of what's going on, and they allow you allow you to track uh, the relationship between uh, variables and that allows you kind of to, 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 to sit there and think okay how do I what is the what is the cause of this correlation tools to organize the data is how do you take a you know you have this big production facility and you know quality and, and, and processes that go into but but you need to find a way that allows you to, to fairly easily see what's going on and that's the flow charts and the Pareto charts they allow you to visually see and look at the overall process and say ah this is where I need to improve my system uh, tools for identifying problems as histograms and uh, you'll see Pareto is a, a, a charts are a unique type of a histogram and the statistical process control chart which we'll talk a, a lot about um, um, in the next few slides so Check sheets. Um, it's just like it's just exactly what y you think it is. It's a, it's a sheet where you just go and you 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 mark how many defects you have in a visual way and what what different types of uh, when and what type of defects you have. And and um, it's really an organized way to record data, but it's also a visual way because it allows you to like you look at this uh, slide and immediately you can see. Wow, I mean, look at our seven and eight. We we had a, a lot of defects going on there. What? Why? What happened at hours seven and eight that suddenly we had a lot of defects? So it allows you to track, but it also gives you a visual sense of what's going on. Um, scatter diagrams they allow you to try and find a correlation between two elements. So you basically uh, have two variables. Here, for example, absenteeism and productivity, and you and and you you correlate both of them and say, okay, uh, when I had this level of absenteeism, then I had this level of productivity. Now, correlation doesn't always mean causation, and you have to remember that the fact that two variables seem to be correlated doesn't mean that there's actually a, a, a also a causation, a cause and effect. A relationship there but scatter diagrams allow you to to compare variables to find uh, to look and see if there is because if there is a causation there if there is a relationship between these two variables and you can improve your quality this uh, would allow you to see it um, 
cause and effect, also known as fishbone or Ishikawa diagrams, uh, they allow you to visually uh, see what is the what are the causes and effects of a problem. So uh, you have uh, four different types of causes, reasons, cause, you know, so let's replace it, replace it with the word reasons of, of why things go wrong. And the effect is that something goes wrong. So you have uh, material reasons, uh, you have methods, manpower, m and machinery, and we'll see an example which will make will show you, really show you how this works but the idea is that you have different reasons different things that can cause something to go wrong and when you look at this fishbone uh, uh, diagram it allows you to visually see what is causing me what is what are the reasons why I am unable to get the high quality that I want so for example if we look at this uh, 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 um, cause and effect uh, diagram uh, the the effect the end of the the end result is that I'm missing my three throws. So I'm starting with the problem. The effect is that I have an issue, and the issue is that my product is not high quality. But here it's I'm missing my three throws, and there are four four um, basic reasons why this is happening. The material is the ball. You know, <laughs> there's something. You know, what what's going on with the ball? The method is 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 how do the the way I am the way I'm shooting the, my 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 basketball. Um, I have the manpower, which is me, the shooter. You know that that's you know p issues reasons with me. And the last one is machine, which stands for you know the 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 hardware, the the hoops and the, the backboard and and you know the the basketball field, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I start I start putting different reasons of what could cause me to miss my my free throw so for example the size of the ball uh, the ball is slippery it doesn't have enough air pressure uh, if I look at the you know at myself I'm not trained enough I'm not motivated enough so you see there's tons of different reasons here uh, divided into these four basic types which all of them together will uh, uh, end with a miss uh, me missing my free my 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 uh, free throws now you, you might think okay so what do I do with this this allows me now to go back and start working on the reasons why I'm not achieving what I want to achieve and improving on it so you know I can see the cause and I can see the effect the next one is a histogram a histogram is just you take a uh, um, uh, data and you put it in a uh, in a graph that shows a distribution of frequency uh, of a variable so the, 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 the uh, what it's showing you like for example here you see the repair time and the frequency the repair time minutes and the frequency is how often does it take me to repair uh, uh, um, my machines or whatever in any given uh, time so let's say the first one is five minutes and the frequency it is four four out of a hundred uh, uh, repairs I can do in five minutes and uh, really what the histogram shows you it shows you it gives you this visual uh, uh, um, um, view of where is the where are the main issues where is the main distribution because you know you see these bars and, you, and it's very easy to see when there's a big bar you see in the middle there's this big bar which gives you the highest frequency and it allows you to focus you want to focus on what's important and that's what the histogram allows you to do uh, uh, Pareto chart um, is a unique type of, of histogram is where you take it and you put them all you kind of reorder your histogram so that the most uh, uh, frequent problems uh, show up uh, uh, first and um, what this allows you it allows you to say okay you know what I need to choose what to fix what to work on first I want it for, of course I want to have total quality management with everything I do but how do I focus to make sure that I am um, uh, um, I start with the most important ones and that's a Pareto uh, chart and the reason um, um, they call it Pareto chart is because of the Italian economist uh, Pareto, Alberto Pareto if I remember correctly that said that found out that 20 80 percent of the wealth in Italy I think it was in the 16th century was uh, was uh, held by 20 percent of the population so to translate it it's the 80 20 rule which you've probably heard uh, many times before but to translate it into this uh, lecture um, basically it means that a few a few issues in your system um, um, are responsible for the majority of your uh, of your defects so if you work on that 20% of issues you're gonna uh, get 80% improvement in terms of quality 
so this just you know just just shows you uh, how uh, 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 an example of a Pareto chart um, um, which shows you um, a frequency uh, um, and then the the uh, percent of uh, of um, uh, the total occurrences so you see that the room service in terms of, of issues or quality issues that we have is 54 um, um, which stands to be 72 percent of the overall issues and then the check-in uh, is 12 we have 12 problems out of let's say 70 or my, you know, 100 and that that comes back comes down to be 16 percent but if you add them together 54 and and, and, and 60 you get to 70 percent so 70 percent of the issues the frequencies that of issues that we're having in our you know in our uh, hotel uh, um, can be covered by room service and check-in so that shows you that really if you focus on room service and check-in you're going to solve 70 percent of the issues you have uh, a flow chart is shows you the steps in a process. So it's ta taking a process as complicated as you want it to be and breaking it down into different steps. And this is a great visual tool that allows you to to uh, uh, get a get 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 a view of what's going on in your system, and it, it allows you to go over visually see where decisions are made, where the process is breaking, and 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 where you might be able to improve. But also, if you improve something or, or change something, what's going to be impacted by it? So this is an example of an MRI chart showing you the different flows of what's happening when you take an MRI. So you start with the, the physician schedules the MRI and then the patient t uh, is taken to the machine and then it signs in and da 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 and at the end, uh, um, um, you know, either it is satisfactory or it's not satisfactory and if it's not satisfactory then you have to go back and, 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 and do it again but really what this allows you to to see is that you see uh, um, what is going on in terms of the actual process of getting a patient into the MRI and you can say ah you know I'm having issue with step number seven how do I reduce the amount of unsatisfactory uh, MRI uh, um, uh, images, uh, you know, that I take of patients, you know, mistakes, and I can focus my my in quality improvement on that specific part of the process, and that's the great thing about flowcharts. It really allows me to see the overall s overall flow of what's going on in the process, and then focus on where I want to improve it. Uh, statistical process control, the, we'll talk about it, uh, we have a, a bunch of slides just talking about it, but it, what it does, it uses statistics uh, in control charts to tell you when you have to uh, um, um, improve your quality or when do you have an issue with your quality control. And, and um, it's, it's based on four key steps. You measure the process, when you see that the process is uh, is changing that it's not following the statistical analysis in terms of, of of the average of what you expect to see. You find what the reason is. You in you eliminate it. You fix it. You do whatever you need to 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 make sure that uh, you know that you don't have that uh, um, 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 reason for for quality issues in the system. And then you try it again and again and again. And, and it's 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 really uh, uh, a, a methodolic methodolo methodological way uh, uh, of um, being able to to uh, um, measure and control in in a, in a scientific way the quality of your um, uh, production process. So, um, how does a how does a, c a control chart look like? So you have. Uh, um, uh, um, an upper control limit and a lower control limit and you have the average or you know the target value and then you just ch you, you, you gather information you gather samples and you, ch you you chart them on this graph now what you can see is you can see that that uh, two points in our graph are outside of of what we define as the upper and lower control limit so they in terms of quality they're not meeting the minimum acceptable uh, quality that we want and uh, um, 
this means that we need to, 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 to stop the process and go and check why. Why is this happening? Why do we have these uh, out of control uh, um, um, uh, inst so now we're moving to uh, quality control, which is going to focus um, um, mainly on SPC, statistical process uh, control, uh, which connects to our the last slide we saw, which is the control chart. Um, what what uh, statistical process control means is it's really a statistical evaluation of the process, and it's always uh, it's always important to remember uh, that you decide what you define as the level of uh, quality control that is acceptable to you you can have a quality control that is extreme extremely rigid with very very high high demands and where you say you know uh, I'm only willing to accept a very 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 low amount of defects and I define defects as, a, as the, the the most the, the tiniest thing that's not right with the product I'm going to send it back for example I gave that example before like like an Apple uh, iPhone you know they're such high quality they you know they they have stories about how uh, Steve Jobs would check the iPhone and uh, the the um, you know the um, headphone uh, jack when he put his uh, headphone in didn't have this nice click sound and he said you know what that doesn't mean my doesn't meet my standards of quality and he, you know he sent it back uh, to the design team so so you can go between those two I mean you can uh, not you can decide you have to decide what you define as quality so all these these statistical process controls are all great They're, they mathematically will tell you when you're outside of your control uh, um, in terms of quality but you have to decide what uh, quality means uh, for your particular business. Uh, any process of manufacturing is going to have variability. It's just you know it's just uh, th the nature of 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 uh, manufacturing stuff. You cannot manufacture everything a hundred percent the same. That's just not possible. You're going to have some variable. Uh, but the question is. Um, is the variation in the process acceptable to you or not acceptable to you? And 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 like I like I mentioned before, that could be something that is really uh, different between every company. You know, again back to the iPhone. An iPhone has certain levels of quality. Uh, Samsung has certain level of qualities. But then if you go to I don't know uh, uh, Huawei which is a Chinese manufacturer, they might have lower levels of quality. And of course, the cost is cheaper, but, but you pay with quality. Um, so the control charts, they are, the, the way you, you construct them is you use historical data or you use benchmarking or, uh, um, you know, it's a combination of you deciding on what, like I said, what you, you, d what you think is high quality. But basically, um, using this information, you uh, decide about what is the acceptable variabi variability um, in terms of the production. So what is the upper limit and the lower limit of what you are willing to accept in terms of variation and uh, what you define as being a random variation which is just part of the process. This is a normal part of production. You're going to have uh, random uncontrollable changes because you know the machine was shaking a little bit when you produce uh, whatever product um, and then you're gonna say oh if it's you know it's with not within those control limits you're gonna call it an abnormal change variation abnormal means that this is not something that you expected as part of the process and that you're willing to accept in terms of quality therefore you need to stop the process and go and check why um, and th this, what this slide shows you is, is um, what is what does it mean in terms of the process control? So you have the lower control limit, you have the upper control limit, and now what you're seeing is that statistically, you know, you're checking everything, and it's between those. So uh, means you know, you, sometimes uh, we like to use big words just to scare people um, and make us feel good about ourselves. So they call it, you know, statistical control and capable. Uh, production control limits but it basically means that you're you know you're sampling your your the products that you manufacture and if they you measure them those samples and if they fall between these two lines with the lower and upper then you're like okay it's okay I don't have to worry about it then what you have is the uh, um, um, a, an issue where 
um, you have uh, the the product is is within the statistical control, but is not capable of of producing something within the control limits. So what it means is that it, even though even though um, um, from a statistical point of view, the, uh, the 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 products that you're manufacturing are in control. They are between the lower and upper control. Uh, um, they are not capable, the entire process is not capable, and that's why you're seeing this graph is bigger than the lower and, and uh, um, 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 lower control and upper control limit. It's not capable of meeting uh, the, the, con the production control limits. Um, but uh, this still, it's, it's still important to remember that the actual process itself is in control. Um, and I know it's, it sounds a little bit confusing, but look at look at uh, example C to see what I mean when it's out of control. Out of control means that it's completely all over the place. Um, so you have some some uh, products that that fall bet b between the lower and upper control limits. Some that that are completely out uh, of the uh, upper. Some are completely out of the lower, and everything. So so you have a c completely chaotic process here, which means you have to stop it and control it. So to sum it up, you have three types of 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 situations that can happen when you see when you measure a, a process. It can be in control and within the limits. Um, it can be in control, but it cannot. It's not capable to meet. Uh, of meeting the 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 whole limits the lim the the high limits of of what you said it's just no matter what you do it's never going to be able to produce this the quality that you want and then there's option C which is, is completely out of control it, it, it not only is it not able to meet uh, will ever be able to meet your quality control uh, requirements it is it's not meeting anything uh, even close to quality control right now. Uh, so you have two types of, of data that you can collect about about a product. You have the variable data and you have attributes. Variable data is anything that you can measure. Uh, so um, um, it's usually continuous variable and you just measure. You, you, you measure the amount uh, um, of the process and and um, um, and then you you check if it's fo it's falling between the upper and lower control limits. Whereas attributes is something you count. Uh, counting is like counting the amount of defects in the products uh, or the amount of defected products from the whole bunch of products that you um, that you uh, manufacture. So let me give you for example. Um, let's say I'm manufacturing pencils the length of the pencil will be a variable and if the length of the pencil let's say you know a pencil a standard pencil should be I don't know uh, five inches and then if it's five and it's acceptable it's uh, if it's 4.8 inches to 5.2 inches but I measure the length of the pencil and based on that length I decide if it's within control or not accounted uh, an attribute would be how many how many little dents do I have in my pencil you know, hopefully you don't have any but I can say you know one to two dents in the uh, in the pencil is okay and that's you know that's that's fine with me up to two dents in the pen a small little dents in the pencil so that's the difference between a variable type of data and an attributed type of data um, so uh, uh, Stop. Uh, I want to stop here for a moment and explain a little bit about uh, um, what it means to do sampling distribution. And um, a lot of people, when you know, when they take this course and they see the math, they get all freaked out. But you really don't have to worry. This course is not about math, and you're not going to really be asked to do any complicated mathematical uh, calculations. But it's interesting when you read the book to kind of understand the concept because I, I think that that um, they're really beautiful. I mean, in terms of of how how they all work together to give you higher levels of quality. So you have basically three t t types of population distributed: the the beta, the normal, and the uniform. I don't I don't want to talk about the beta and the uniform. I want to talk about the normal because that's what you, you, in most cases you're going to see. A normal distribution is, is like a bell, and and really what it what it um, 
it tells you the top of the bell is the average, the mean. Also, average they also you know can also call it mean. Uh, and and really, normal distribution is is how we think about life. Uh, generally as humans it means that most people most things most processes are in the average that's why we call it the average most of them are in the average a few of them are better than the average and a few of them are less than the average and that's why you have this uh, this this hill less going to most of the hill is in the middle and then uh, uh, um, some of it is is, is down uh, uh, and some of it is on the other side so really this is this is way a way to to describe a distribution of a process to describe the the way a, a process behaves in the way that most of us intuitively think about life that that m most things are in the middle and then you have the middle is the biggest and then you have some that are in the, at the bottom and some that are, are at the top now the the sigma these numbers, this one, two, three, plus one, plus two, three, plus three, tells you the standard deviation. How far are you? How much do you deviate from the mean, from the average? And why is that important? Because, like we said, th this, there's no process that's perfect. You can't just say, "Okay, I'm going to be always in the middle, perfect." No, uh, the real life is you have deviations. Sometimes you're going to be a little bit lower. Sometimes you're going to be a little bit higher. And and you deciding how much of the process you're willing to allow to deviate is basically controlling how much of the process, uh, how, the, the level of quality you de you're demanding from the process. So Im important for the exam is that uh, 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 plus minus three standard deviation means that 99.73% of your products are within your control limit. That's a very aggressive, very aggressive uh, uh, target in terms of manufacturing. Uh, remember, six sigma is 99.99997, so six sigma is even crazier. Uh, but for the exam, just remember that 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 three sigma is 99.73. So setting the chart limits. I'm not going to talk about these uh, mathematical notations. If you want to learn more about them, you can read the book. Uh, again, for the exam, you're not going to be asked to do all these complicated computations. But it's I th I personally think it's it's fascinating to to learn them if you can if you find it interesting. Uh, but really, um, uh, basically, what I want you to get from this slide is that you have to mathematically decide on how to 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 set up an upper con upper control limit and a lower control limit, and that's 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 all that's just trying to tell you is that when you create a chart and you, you start collecting the data and you put all these dots on the chart, you have to decide which dots based on the upper control limit are above your control limit and which dots are below the control limit, and hopefully none of none of the dots or none of the statistical information you find is is is, is above or beyond those two lines. So uh, this gives you like an uh, uh, you know a numerical example of how do you find the upper control limit and the lower control limit and and uh, if you want you can pause uh, this uh, video and then kind of go over it. It really it, it really is completely uh, uh, um, easy to understand. It says that the upper control limit and the lower control limit to find them you use the function that the previous slide. Uh, um, describe just by plugging the mean, which is the average, which is the 16 you see in both of them, and to this average, the 16, um, you decide how much standard deviation, how much variation you're willing to allow, and in our case, we're willing, w we are willing to allow uh, one ounce up and two ounces down, uh, one ounce up, sorry, and one ounce down variation from the average of 16. So anything uh, um, that is above 17 and anything that is below 15 is out of our control limit. So here this is a, a taking the numerical example from before and you see the points that are out of the control. So these points are, are the, the points that, that the, the the, the, the last three points are out of control and that means for me when I'm checking this and I'm looking at this and I go okay I think I have an issue here I need to go and check why am I having this out of control uh, processes and which means that I my the product that I'm uh, producing are not meeting the quality standards that I decided are acceptable uh, and our chart 
is uh, is a chart that shows you range and and what it means uh, this I think this um, shows explains it better is that you have two types of, of charts that you can use you can use the average which tells you how are you in terms of sampling uh, um, far from the average uh, um, production quality you want so in our previous example example that was how how much do I deviate from 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 the number 16 in terms uh, of my my sampling but what it doesn't tell you is range and range is different what does it mean um, let me give you a numerical example uh, array uh, the um, you know the average of a hundred and um, and fifty is uh, 150 divided by 2 is 75 the average of a range between 0 and 75 is also 75 but obviously these are two different ranges 50 to 100 and 0 to 75 so when you measure range you want to you want to you want to measure how dispersed it is how much how much are we uh, moving between uh, the you know the actual samples how are they different different between each other in terms of the ranges and not necessarily the average because when you average stuff um, and you compare them to the average uh, by by nature you you're going to smooth out uh, a lot of things that you're not going to see and this this um, this uh, a slide uh, shows you two examples of it uh, you see that. Uh, in in uh, the sampling, uh, the, you know the sampling distribution that result in these two, you see on the x uh, x bar, uh, which is our mean, that's also known as a the mean charts are also known as an x bar chart. You see there's an issue. You look at it and you say, okay, oh yeah yeah, I see it's out of control. But if you look at the r chart, the range chart, it looks fine. So that's where that's where you'll be like if you only use the range chart. And you didn't use a combination of a uh, of a uh, mean and range chart, you wouldn't see that there's an issue, because you see you see these um, these graphs uh, uh, at the upper uh, side of the of the um, of the slide. You see that they're all within the same range. They all they all they all have the same width in terms of the the graph, but in terms of the the uh, average they're, they're starting to go up and getting out of control now the other side of this um, story is that you can have everything that on average the average everything looks okay but the range of the different uh, 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 controls that you have is becoming bigger and bigger and that's where you see in this example that the width of the the graph uh, the standard deviation graph is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, but the average is the same, which you wouldn't see on an X uh, bar chart, but you will see in, a, in an R chart that detects the, the increases in dispersion. Now, if you listening to all this and you're starting to lose focus and you're like, oh my god, you know, I, don't worry about it. Uh, again, the exam is not about, about uh, ma mathematically understanding uh, all these things. What's important for you to understand for the exam is the concepts of of, of, uh, of a mean chart and a range chart. Uh, but you're not going to be asked to actually calculate, um, you know, the the standard deviations of each one of them. Uh, the control chart, we al the control chart, uh, we already talked about it, but it's important to uh, remember the the terms. You have abnormal variation is what you call um, an out of control uh, uh, instance that that is, is is because of an assignable cause an assignable cause means that you can you 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 can go you can check it and you can understand why this is happening why you can assign a cause to why this is out of control whereas normal variation is just just part you, you there's no way you can find out why this is just part of the normal uh, a way that um, a, a, that the machine works that gives you some kind of random variation in terms of production quality um, so we already spoke about control charts uh, for variables. The variables is, is, is when you use the X bar charts and the R charts and those are for things you can measure and attributes is what you can count and that's where you have the P charts and the C charts. The P chart uh, moni monitors the proportion of defectives in a, in a, in a, in a process, that's the percentage, how many total uh, of uh, um, um, products were defected out of a hundred, and I can say, oh, you know, in my process, 
I am willing to accept a 10% defect. That's super high, but let's say that means that out of 100, I'm willing to accept uh, up to 10 uh, products that are defect. Uh, a C chart, which uh, also counts uh, the number of defects, can go per unit. I can say I'm willing, using my previous example, I'm willing for each pencil to have up to two dents. Uh, on it, small dents that are, you know, um, on each uh, pencil is acceptable. So that 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 is per unit and not per the entire lot of what I'm producing. Um, so this is just to show you that basically, in terms of control charts, they they all follow the same uh, concept of having an upper control limit and a lower control limit. So yes, they have different names and they're used for different things, but they all come down to, they look the same and they all come down to finding when your process is out of control using statistical information. So again, well, I'm going to skip this math slides, uh, but um, if you if you find this interesting and you want to learn more, they have really, really great examples in the book that uh, show you uh, really step by step how to use this in a real life situation. And I know it might look very complicated, it is not. It is very, very, very straightforward. So, um, in terms of control charts, um, what's from a managerial point of view, what's important to, to remember about uh, control charts is that uh, even though they're, they're math and they're numbers and they're graphs, uh, you can't become too obsessed about them. You need to you need to make sure that you understand that the control chart measures what you tell it to measure. So if you decide that uh, you are willing to accept higher quality, then the control charts are going to show what you define as quality. And I started this entire section by explaining that quality, even though you can measure it and, and, and you can have all, di all different types of tools of how to control it, it days in, it's a qualitative thing that you decide what you define as quality and what your customers define as quality and how extreme you want to be about the quality because there's always a cost. You cannot have in infinite amount of quality. There is going to be a point where the benefits from your quality uh, uh, is, is going to be less than the cost of implementing this high quality and that's when you probably want to stop uh, pushing for that degree of quality because you're starting to lose money and you're not really gaining any more benefits. Um, this is kind of to sum up very quickly when to use each control chart. So the when you have variable data, you use the X bar chart and the R chart. Uh, when you have attributed data, remember counting data, that's when you use the P chart and, and you use the C chart. Uh, process capability, um, an important aspect of, of you know, coming with control charts and, and, and quality definitions in general is that you have to make sure that your process is capable to produce the quality that you want. So you can, you know, ha have an engineer sit in a room with a piece of paper and, and come up with all these mathematical equations with, with beautiful, perfect quality design and quality upper limits and, and lower control limits, but your actual machines cannot produce them. So <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, you have to make sure that whatever uh, quality decisions you decided to, to uh, um, uh, come up with in terms of the actual machines and people who have to produce them, they're viable. There's something that your, your machine and your organization, organization is actually capable of, 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 of achieving. Otherwise, it's just it's, it's futile. It's not going to work. Uh, methods for generating ideas. Um, this, you know, in terms of quality, how do you, how do you, we, we said continuous improvement. How, how do we, uh, um, what kind of methods do we have to, 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 to help us uh, and, uh, come with ideas of improvement? So brainstorming, everybody knows what a brainstorming is. Quality circles is when you take a bunch of employees and, and, and you know, that have uh, expertise and, 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 and uh, 
process that you're trying to improve and you ask them to 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 work and come with ideas on how to improve the quality interviewing which is where you you, you talk with the people um, that that work at the process you know the the, the it could, you know it could be the assembly line worker and you kind of ask and, and questions and try to understand how the process works and how you can make it better benchmarking means you know uh, taking whatever you produce and comparing it either to historical data or standard uh, uh, data from the industry affinity diagrams is when you take uh, uh, a bunch of of uh, ideas and, and problems and you group them together into logically similar groups uh, so later on it's easier for you to say okay I'm gonna today where I'm gonna focus just about the the manufacturing process of this product with this type of issues and, and logically have a separation that's what affinity diagrams are the 5w2h is uh, a, a set of questions that if you are really truly able to answer them they're they're going to help you tremendously understand how you can improve your system which is who what when where why how much and how often